The Conrad Kerr's That Could Have Been, a Loyalist Night Haunter. As I am sure you could not possibly have failed to notice, Conrad Kerr's is, by quite some margin, my favourite Primarch, and I've been wanting to make a bit of a theory craft video on a Loyalist Night Haunter for quite some time now, and I figured this is as good a time as any to indulge myself. So. Let's have a little bit of fun, shall we, trying to figure out how a Loyalist Night Haunter might happen. And on that note, whilst of course this will be theory crafting, we are going to try and keep it within the realms of possibility. Something that could potentially and logically happen, taking into consideration Conrad's backstory and of course the nature of the planet upon which he grew up. We will be trying to avoid the more uh, crazy out there forms of speculation, like asking, for example, what if the Chaos Gods had simply chosen to not mess with young Conrad's mind whilst he lay sleeping in the gestation pod? You know, that would absolutely change things, certainly, but also, why would the Chaos Gods choose to not do so? After all, they are working towards their own end goal, their own scenario as well. We can also choose to ask, what if Conrad had been adopted by a family on Nostramo in somewhat the same way as Korax was adopted on Deliverance, but once again, this is Nostramo. There weren't a whole lot of families on that godforsaken planet that would even consider adding to their already overpowering burden with another mouth to feed, much less a mouth like Conrad Kurz's. And even if he was to be adopted, do you think being raised by a family on Nostramo would result in a kinder, gentler night haunter? Or do you think it would simply result in an even worse monster? I know which results my money would be on. At the end of the day, I firmly believe that the only person who could ever have truly saved Conrad Kurz was Conrad Kurz himself. And it's not like there were a lack of moments in which he could have done so. Conrad Kurz was not naturally a monster, as we can quite clearly see throughout his history. For all his cruelty, for all his evils and vile, vicious actions, even at the very end, while sitting in that dark, stinking room on the freshly built fortress on the world of Tsugulsa, where he crafted a statue of the Emperor from the broken broken bones and torn flesh of servants, he was still trying to find some way to justify his actions. He crafted that statue to yell at it, to scream at it, to lambast it, to move the blame for all of his actions over onto the Emperor. Kurz had never done anything wrong. He had been made this way. He had been predestined to become a monster. And so he himself was blameless. If he could never have avoided this fate in the first place, if he could never have done anything to change his future, if this was all predetermined by a careless father, Kurz was blameless even as he himself knew that this was not the case. In fact, it was probably that realization that finally broke his mind and saw his personality splinter into that of Kurz and the Night Haunter. But spend a second to actually think about what Conrad Kurz was doing in that dark room mere hours before what he believed to be his inescapable death. A death that he marched to willingly ordering his legionnaires to not intervene because he viewed it as the only way to prove his visions correct. He viewed it as the last way to prove that he was not at fault. He literally saw his death as the only way to prove to himself and the galaxy that he was not the monster. What other Primarch would go to those lengths? Which other Primarch would wish to justify their actions or doubted them enough to begin with to even need justification? Lorgar? 
Logo was convinced he had found the inescapable truth. The all-consuming religion in whose name any atrocity was not only justifiable, but desirable. Logar never wondered if he was correct in doing what he was doing. He waded through oceans of blood and never once looked back. Not honestly. And what about the War Master? Did Horus ever doubt himself? No. Not until the very end, when the Chaos God's influence over him was pulled away for a split second. He was entirely convinced that he was not tearing the Imperium apart. He was not trying to destroy it. He was trying to rescue it from what he viewed as his father's tyranny. A true and noble goal. What about the others? Angron? <laughs> Do you think he ever questioned what he was doing? Petarabo? Fulgrim? <laughs> no. At the end of the day, the only one that seemed to have had an actual conscience was Kurz. Which is quite ironic, seeing as he was also probably the most monstrous of them all, at the very least in appearance and to a degree in action as well. But the very fact that he was trying to justify it, the very fact that he was trying to find some angle, some point of view in which he was not the villain, but rather the tragic abused hero, shows us quite a lot about Conrad's character, and how, despite it all, he was probably closer to the light than most of his fallen brethren. And taking that into account, where then do we actually begin if we can't start in his gestation pod and if we can't simply assume that he was adopted by the presumably only good family on the entirety of Nostramo, where would the loyal part of the loyal Night Hunter actually start? I think it would begin at a very early age with Conrad himself consciously refusing to take in everything that surrounded him. You may notice that on this custom artwork right here, amongst many other little subtle changes, this version of Kurz has a blindfold covering his eyes. That is because he is blind. We cannot change Nostramo. We cannot change the fact that it is one of the shittiest planets in 30k. We cannot change the fact that virtually every single person who lives on that planet is a criminal in some way, shape, form, or capacity, even all the way down to young children. We cannot change the fact that it is ruled by a governing class of nobles who engages in open war with one another, utilizing organized crime syndicates as personal armies to bathe the streets in blood. Nostramo is everything that is wrong with the human condition. It is greed, it is anger, it is violence, it is abuse, it is merciless murder at its worst. But we can change how Conrad Curse chooses to perceive it. And stay with me here. This is a hint convoluted, but I promise it does make a degree of sense. First and foremost, all of the Primarchs, Conrad Curse included, were implanted with a vast amount of knowledge from their very creation. They were programmed to know all of this, although they knew it, but they did not understand it. Conrad Kurz knew that a bullet lodged in his torso would slow him down, just as he knew that it wouldn't kill him. He could tell you precisely where it was lodged, next to which bone, and next to which organ or muscle group. All of this, he could just list it off. He could tell you the precise chemical composition of blood, but he wouldn't actually understand any of that or, hell, even necessarily know what blood is. It would be like a rocket scientist listing off all of the requirements for getting a rocket into orbit via mathematical equations. You would understand that these numbers mean this, you know, this is a 1, this is a 2, this is a decimal point, but you wouldn't be able to grasp the significance of these numbers put into context. It would simply just be numbers, rather than the means through which we fire massive rockets into space. 
And along with this information, the Primarchs are also programmed with a series of preferences, with proclivities. Things that are placed within them in an attempt to guide them towards becoming the kind of general or administrator or tool of terror that the Emperor would want them to be. In the case of Conrad Kurz, he was supposed to be the perfect judge, and the absolute arbiter, whose judgments would never be questioned due to the terror of the consequences for doing so. Make no mistake, Conrad Kurz and the Eighth Legion were intended to be weapons of terror, but crucially, the terror was to be a consequence, rather than the tool with which the means could be achieved. The Eighth Legion was supposed to be the very large stick with which you threaten a foe, and force him to surrender lest you hit him over the head with it. Whilst instead, Conrad would bludgeon to death the first man he saw, and then threaten the rest that the same thing would happen to them should they resist. And this was not done because of some sense of malice, necessarily, it all stemmed from one simple misunderstanding, or perhaps misinterpretation is more correct, or perhaps even an overly narrow point of view. As mentioned, Conrad Kurz would have a lot of knowledge. Every single law ever written would be somewhere within his mind. Every single treatise on justice or the correct application of legal force would be somewhere within his mind. But due to the fact that he is unable to understand any of this on a philosophical level or on a deeper level, he simply had to make simple, logical decisions. In the case of the Conrad Kurz that existed, this was that the law punishes the guilty. No differential, no nuance, no degrees. There is only the law and the punishment for breaking it. A child's interpretation of the legal system. But what if he had latched on to an equally basic and ubiquitous principle of justice? Namely, that no two crimes are ever quite the same. Ever since the very creation of the concepts of law and order, it was understood that stealing a fish and bludgeoning a man to death with a rock would require different punishments. And in fact, to fail to take this into consideration and simply punish every crime the same would itself be unjust and illegal, making whoever did it a criminal. Once again, this is logic that even a child could understand, and it is an equally basic principle of the legal system. There are crimes, there are punishments, but there are also always different punishments. And this one simple change in priority would lead to a very different Night Haunter. Now, he would still be a symbol of abject terror on Nostramo, absolutely, because he would still have the overriding goal of creating law and order on the lawless planet of Nostramo, and simply handing out tickets, even if Conrad could understand the concept, would not have done much to restore any kind of control over such a planet. Instead, it would lead to a slightly more philosophical Night Haunter. He would ask himself the question, what punishment is this crime worthy of? And he would very slowly but surely develop a moral framework for himself via trial and error. He would punish someone, and he would then see the reactions of the rest of the community, just like the Night Haunter, the chaotic version that is, did. When he saw crime, he simply killed the criminal, assuming therefore the matter to be settled, and yet people continued to steal. No matter how many criminals Conrad killed, there seemed to be no end to it, there seemed to be no change and no consequence in the wider community. And so naturally, Conrad simply came to the logical conclusion that merely killing them was not enough. And so he started stepping up his game. 
And in so doing, Kurz got very, very creative. He drew upon all of the knowledge he possessed to come up with more and more hideous ways of killing people. He used his understanding of human biology to extend the torture sessions. He used his knowledge of human psychology to target the loved ones of the criminals. He got very... Very inventive with all of this, showing that he is more than able to actually investigate his own thoughts and ideas and find ways of applying them in the real life. The loyalist Conrad would do much the same thing. He would see a crime and he would ruminate upon it. He'd check with his mental database. What kind of a crime is this? What kind of a punishment would be correct for such a crime? He would undoubtedly run into a wide variety of terms that he would not yet understand, ideas such as a, a fine or a warning, and so he would probably, at first at the very least, simply just fall back on the most straightforward punishment. Stealing, for example. A rather common punishment for stealing used to be losing a limb. That's simple enough. Even young Conrad can understand that. You've stolen something, and therefore I am going to take from you the ability to steal in the future. Simple. Logic even a child could understand. In this case, a superhuman child with a bit too much of a justice boner. And of course, just like with the chaotic Conrad, this would also escalate. He'd chop off the first hand and people wouldn't stop stealing. So the next time, he'd cut off their fingers first, before severing the hand. People still wouldn't stop stealing. So next time, he would flay the fingers before chopping them off. Again, people don't stop stealing. He'd flay the entire arm. And so on and so on and so on. He would become just as inventive with this as he ever was with displaying his kills as the chaotic Conrad. The key difference is that this Conrad would still stay within certain limits of what he would do. And unlike the chaotic Conrad, this version of him would probably achieve order quicker. Because... Well, a live criminal will spread the word of the monster in the dark a hell of a lot quicker than a dead one will. But this alone I do not think would be enough to fully turn him from his path. It would change, however, a fundamental problem with the chaotic Conrad. Namely, that he ruled like a tyrant atop a mountain of tortured corpses. He created the perfect society through nothing but fear of the most gruesome death imaginable. He ruled purely and solely through that fear. And yeah... Sure, fear and terror are most certainly effective ways to control a populace, but only so far. Think for a moment on how unbelievably oppressive a regime this would be. A regime under which any crime, no matter how minor, and with the definition of what is and isn't a crime ever expanded upon by Conrad's own frantic mind, by death. No, not just by death, by death via torture at the hands of a Primarch for days, if not weeks, if not months. I am not entirely sure that it is even humanly possible to exist in such an oppressive reality without trying to rebel against it, without trying to fight back against the fear. Humans are remarkably adaptable creatures, but this level of psychic torture? I think perhaps the rebellion against the Night Haunter was inevitable. And of course, another problem with ruling an entire society based entirely upon the fear of a single individual is that when that individual leaves, what then is there to be afraid of? It is quite the testament to just how thoroughly Conrad had scared the ever-living piss out of Nostraman society that it still took years after his departure for the populace to gather up the courage to actually 
openly rebel against him. But eventually, and I would think almost inevitably, they did. And when Kurz returned to punish the treachery, he committed the act of genocide that was the destruction of Nostramo, the final act that turned him from a loyalist and to a traitor. But with the new, Conrad's focus upon the simple fact that justice comes in many different forms, and that many different crimes requires different punishments, even if Nostramo was to rebel against him in the future, he would not commit wholesale genocide on the entire population. Indeed, even the chaotic Conrad was not planning to do so to begin with. He spent a great deal of time and effort rooting out the conspiracy, and building a case based on evidence to present to his brethren. But then his visions came, stronger than ever, and drove him entirely mad, causing him not only to kill an innocent individual, which was yet another drop in the bucket which finally overflowed with his assault upon Rogal Dorn. This led him to kill several more Imperial Fists, flee, and head to the Nostraman system, where he took out all of his rage, anger, and frustration upon the planet enacting upon it the ultimate sanction of exterminatus. And so even if, as mentioned, the more balanced Conrad would not wipe out the entire populace as a matter of course, we still have the madness to contend with. We have fixed several problems by simply just having Conrad appreciate the fact that not all crimes are the same, but the biggest hurdle yet remains how to overcome his visions. We have already laid the groundwork for this by having Conrad be less of an extremist than the chaotic version of him. This probably then will allow him to do something else that is vital for having Conrad remain a loyalist. Namely, choosing to save, rather than kill, a certain young criminal talked about in the Conrad Kerr's book. Because that guy hadn't actually done anything. If you don't know the passage I'm speaking about, in the Conrad Kerr's Primark book, Conrad describes an encounter with a pair of criminals that were about to rape and rob a woman, but they hadn't actually done anything by the time Conrad intervened. They had certainly threatened her, and they'd certainly made their intents uh, clear, shall we say. And Conrad had simply descended down from on high and just stood there, amused at this latest piece of degeneracy playing out before his very eyes. One of the two youngsters had made the great decision to go for a weapon right in front of Conrad, and even the more uh, reasonable version of him would undoubtedly uh, react somewhat violently to such an offence. And so there was just one young hooligan, who Conrad gave a chance to escape. This too, I imagine, would fully be within the character of the good, quote-unquote, Conrad, playing a bit with his food. After all, he is still basically a super-powered child. He's gotta have some fun, after all. But obviously, Conrad eventually chased him down, and then he had a vision. In this vision, he saw two possible futures. In both, he reached out a hand to the young boy. In one, the boy took this as a sign of weakness and stabbed Conrad. Whilst in the second vision, he reached up his own hand to take Conrad's proffered hand. Conrad helped him up, and adopted him essentially as his disciple. He saw a future in which he had already organized a large militia-type force of justices, of arbiters, long before he left Nostramo, long before the coming of the Emperor, he had already created his army, and all of them would share his vision of law and order. In the book, Conrad rejected this future because he felt it was too much of a threat, too much of a danger. If the child decided to stab him, then he would no longer be as fearsome. Conrad would no longer be feared by the criminal underworld, and so they would run rampant. 
However, uh, the new Conrad, I do not think would view it as such. I think our version of Conrad would see this for what it was, an opportunity. Justice needed to be done, and it was getting awfully tiring passing judgement on everyone. Having disciples would make things a lot easier, and it would also allow him to replicate certain aspects of civilized law that he no doubt knew about but had never been able to replicate. Stuff like juries, or judgement by one's peers. These would all be theories that would be very interesting to a Conrad that actually wanted justice rather than merely just executions for any and all crimes. Not to mention, of course, the myriad other benefits of a private army. Conrad could finally begin establishing a true legal system in which he, of course, would be the supreme judge. But that did not mean that he would not be able to delegate. And this really is the crucial part. Because when it comes to the visions, I firmly believe that Conrad could not save himself from them. As we saw again in the Conrad Kerr's Primark book, he was unable to control himself when he was lost in the more powerful visions, and whilst entranced like this, he committed one of the most crucial acts that sent him down the wrong path, the murder of a scribe that had never done anything wrong, the murder of an actual, genuine innocent, which in Kurz's mind made him no better than the scum he had hunted down in the streets of Nostramo. So no, I do not believe that Conrad Kurz himself, no matter how we might change his mind or his perception of the law or his priorities, would be able to win against the visions. And since these were planted into him by the Chaos Gods with the express purpose of turning him, if they are not halted, if Kurz is not talked out of his more extreme measures, he will inevitably fall. But with a group around him of loyal brethren that share his visions and also crucially that he respects, they might be able to save him. They might be able to talk him into doing the sensible thing. They might, most importantly of all, be able to convince him to share the burden because Kurz always put all of it on himself. When Nostramo betrayed him, he viewed that as a personal betrayal. When members of the Night Lord's legions started engaging in torture outside of Conrad's sanctions, he again viewed that as a personal failing on his behalf, and he dealt with it personally. He straight up murdered all of the Night Lords that he had found guilty of deviating from his commands, which obviously yet furthered the gap between Conrad and his legion. It's also important to point out here that you might think Conrad, the chaotic version of him, had support. He had his legion, and he did have at least a few within it that genuinely did believe in him. And whilst this is true to an extent, the vast majority of the Night Lord's Legion, at the time when Conrad was to fall fully to chaos, were not really particularly infatuated with Conrad Kurz's teachings, with his philosophies and his ideals. There was only a small number of the upper echelons of the legions, and a few amongst the rank and file, that had any real faith anymore in Conrad's way of doing things. A lot of them, albeit not quite all of them, were in it solely for their own benefit. Whereas this new legion of order, it would have been formed much, much earlier, and the crux, the core of this new formation would be Kurz and that very first disciple. It would essentially be 
an order of zealots, practically. Only those that truly believed in Conrad's vision would flock to his banner willingly. Again, I remind you, no matter how much more balanced this version of Conrad may be, he would still be an image of absolute nightmare to the population of Nostramo. And those who would go to him willingly... <laughs> They are bound to be amongst those with the strongest of convictions. With this army of true believers, of zealots, Conrad Kurz could then build a much firmer foundation, not just for the Eighth Legion, but for Nostramo as a whole. Something the chaotic Conrad lacked almost absolutely. There are indications that some at the very pinnacle of the society he left behind were still loyal to him, but that must have been virtually all of it as well, since shortly after Conrad's departure, the criminal syndicate had a resurgence of power, until at the end, they could literally just walk into the halls of the Senate, execute one of the high nobles, and have no one resist. Not a shot fired in anger, not a voice raised in protest. The only thing that were keeping them compliant was the fear of Conrad Kurz. Although, with that word, compliant, there is an interesting note. The criminal syndicates didn't want to secede from the Imperium. They were more than happy to continue to offer up the tithes that the Empire acquired. They viewed that simply as a larger, stronger organization, and paying protection money, essentially, was something that they could understand. It shows that Nostrama wasn't necessarily unhappy under the rule of the Imperium, and that the only thing that they were really rising up against, I believe, is the fear. The mind-numbing, destroying fear. They had to resist, they had to fight back, and they found strength in the old ways, in the glory days before the coming of the Night Haunter. If, however, our Conrad left behind a organized society of rules, law, and strong legislators all loyal to Conrad's vision, I believe it would be much more difficult, if not indeed flat out impossible, for organized crime to spread in the same way as it did on Old Nostramo. Because I don't think that the general populace missed those days. I don't think the general populace enjoyed living in fear of the criminal syndicates, enjoyed starving, and existing only at the mercy and the whims of those above them. I firmly believe that if Kurz could build an alternative to this, a strong, loyal, stable Nostramo, then people would fight to defend it, they would fight to preserve it, and they would see it as in their best interest to maintain it. Even if the criminal elements attempted a resurgence after Conrad left, there would still be those loyal to Kurz's vision. There would still be those in power able to crack down on these criminal elements. And with the nature of Nostramo being what it was, and, of course, a base for the 8th Legion Astartes, the Terror Legion, I see no reason why they couldn't have succeeded. Hell, a single company of old-school Terran-born 8th Legionnaires would be more than enough to pacify any resurgent criminal elements. And if Nostramo remained strong and remained loyal, then the corruption of the 8th Legion would not take place. It began because the officials on Nostramo had not adopted Conrad's vision. They remained corrupt and loyal only to themselves. They sent the 8th Legion the dregs of society, whom the captains, traitors as they were as well, accepted into their ranks because their loyalties lay first and foremost to their old syndicates back home rather than to Conrad Kurz. This, again, was simply because Kurz had not instilled them with a sense of loyalty. He did not build a legion for himself, instead he simply just brought the rough Nostraman underhive elements into space 
and gave them superhuman powers. And that, of course, ended up working out uh, just as well as... <laughs> as you would think it would. But now that we've changed these two things, we might actually end up with a loyalist night haunter. First and foremost, he will not lose himself as much to the darkness when he actually has to temper his justice with, well, actual law and justice. And secondly, his visions will become less and less real to him. He always stated that whilst he could not tell the real future, the one future, the one future that was inescapable, always had a certain feel to it. That is why Kurz viewed it as the inescapable future, as the absolute future. And despite fighting against it with everything he had, he could never quite manage to separate himself from it, because he himself thought that he couldn't. He convinced himself that there was no fighting this future, and so he simply kept going down the route predetermined by it. But here, with his first student and his new moral compass, he would not be able to just kill him, because the kid had not committed a crime. And so, Conrad would be forced, indirectly by his own moral compass and his current values, to stretch out his hand instead. And when the kid didn't stab him, because he literally could not have stabbed Kurz from that position, that would introduce the first glimmer of doubt to Conrad's mind. And as time went on, as the Emperor arrived, as he met his brothers, and he left Nostramo, and ventured out into the galaxy to conquer yet further worlds for the God Emperor, he would also see his legion not degrading around him. There is a mention in the Primarch book, and also in other source materials, that to begin with, Conrad made every effort to make himself, at the very least, look the part, to look like a lord of men. He groomed himself, he polished his armour, he did everything he could to become an example for his legion, but at that point in time, it was already far too late. And when it came time for him to execute his first squad of Night Lords, who had gone against his commands and had tortured simply for the hell of it, he completely gave up on all that. He viewed it as a charade, as him fruitlessly fighting against destiny. But that would not be necessary with a loyalist Kurz because that corruption would not set in. And even if he did, he would be surrounded by loyal servants who would execute them for him. With loyal and devoted officers and sergeants, anyone who went against Conrad's teachings would almost certainly be purged at a very early stage. Though we should bear in mind that the Eighth was still a terror legion, the employment of torture and brutal tactics was a key part of their combat doctrine, and it is entirely possible that some of them might be corrupted during the course of their service within the legion. But when most of them are completely convinced of Conrad's teachings, and are doing this out of a sense of genuine duty rather than pleasure, those who fall out would almost certainly also be ostracized and purged from the Legion organically, rather than forcing it all upon Conrad. And this would be the second point of failure. Conrad expected to see his Legion fall apart around him. Conrad never really bonded with his Legion. In fact, he stated on multiple occasions that he outright hated them because he viewed them as nothing more than yet another failure on his path to becoming the monster. If, however, they remain steadfast, that would be another crack, another fault in the inescapable prophecy. And so through the actions and loyalty of others, Conrad Kurz in turn would be much better suited to fight off the corruption. And even should the madness seize him momentarily, the ones surrounding him would be loyal 
to him and to his vision. So if he was to ever do something that would blatantly go against his own principles, like for example exterminating the entirety of Nostramo, they would stop him. And they would be able to do so, again, because this version of Conrad would value justice over simple expedience. They could make the logical argument that this action is not just. It is not correct. It would turn you, Lord, into a criminal and not the ones you are executing. And even should he be lost in his visions, I believe this form of argumentation would hold a great deal of weight for our loyalist Conrad Kurz. He would already have seen the inescapable future splinter and break. He will already have seen that it can be wrong, that the future can be changed. That very knowledge, along with his new ideals, would give him the strength required to overcome his visions and to deny them. With these two changes, I believe a loyalist night haunter would not only be a possibility, but almost a foregone conclusion. Or at least, that is my theory on the matter. And with the theory crafting now more or less out of the way, I'd like to direct your attention to the artwork on the screen, because there are a lot of little cool touches here that have been worked in to represent a loyal Conrad Kurz. We will start with his back-mounted power pack, and the fact that he is wearing something that looks almost like a librarius hood, because it is. Conrad Kurz realized his own psychic powers, he realized where his visions were coming from, and he sought to control them, to guide them, and to hone them. Perhaps he even sought advice from some of his brother Primarchs. And of course, you may also notice the scales mounted on his back. This is to reflect the fact that this version of Conrad is not quite so single-minded as his chaotic version. He does not punish every crime with execution. Rather, he weighs up and judges each and every man's misdeeds to come up with a suitable punishment. But of course... That does not mean that he is a particularly cuddly individual either, as is written on his chest plate, Dominus Nox Lex, the law of the night. Because first and foremost, the rule of law that Conrad Kurz recognizes is his own law. He is undoubtedly going to be a very harsh, but also fair, judge. He will not convict the innocent, but the guilty he will punish in extremis. He is, after all, still Conrad Kurz. Although, by his face, you can also see something else other than just the blindfold. He is incredibly pale, and part of his raven black hair, although clean and groomed, some of it has turned to white due to the extreme efforts he placed into resisting his visions, which could in many ways be viewed as de facto programming worked into him by the Chaos Gods. That is not something anyone overcomes easily, and he has undoubtedly sacrificed much to do so. But even in his much reduced state, he is still also again clearly a much more refined individual. You may also notice that he is carrying a very large sword. Conrad Kurz's favorite weapon, of course, was his twin claws, mercy and forgiveness. But this version of Conrad utilizes that weapon far less frequently. He views that as a weapon to be used for special punishment. It is his in extremis solution favoring instead, usually, a large two-handed sword. It is a weapon of authority and execution. It is a tool of murder, absolutely, but it is a tool of just murder, with the full force of the law behind it. When the Night Haunter swings the sword, it is a mercy killing, a just killing, a deserved killing. When he uses his claws, 
That is the weapon of the beast, the monster. And Kurz absolutely will call upon that side of himself, even in his loyal form, because he still understands that some miscreants, some criminals, some evil individuals understand nothing except death and torment of the vilest kind. And if he has to unleash the beast on one poor individual, so that he can use the sword on a hundred more, Kurz views that as a worthwhile sacrifice. And that is also why this Conrad is still dappled with a bit of blood, why he still has a pair of sinner's skulls attached to the large armoured gargoyle on his shoulder guard, his new emblem. Because Conrad Kurz is still absolutely a weapon of terror. The difference lies in his control over that terror. This is a Kurz that uses fear as a tool rather than allowing fear to use him. His sword is pristine and clearly impeccably maintained. His hair is cleaned and groomed. He is a lord of men while still also remaining an icon of potential fear for those who should choose to go against him. He has maintained the morbid aspects of his armour, the bat wings, the skulls, the gargoyle insignia, and his ribbed chest plate. But instead of appearing as little more than a debased ghoul, this Conrad looks far more like the vampire lord he is, an aristocrat of the night rather than a slinking monster. I gotta say, it was really cool to have this piece of artwork done of Conrad. I'm really thinking of now of launching into a little bit more of a theory crafty series, a bit of a, a side project, maybe a a Horus Heresy What If. Perhaps we could reverse the roles entirely and have the loyalists become traitors and the traitors become loyalists. Because even though a lot of the other Primarchs are going to require a lot more in the way of creative retconning than Conrad, I absolutely could see a way for there to be a loyalist Petarabo, a loyalist Lorgar, a loyalist Fulgrim. Hell, the Alpha Legion would be the easiest of all. The only change I need to do there is that Alpharius pulls out a bolt pistol and blows the head of the first Eldar he meets. <laughs> okay, we're probably gonna have to go a hint deeper than that, but it is certainly a possibility. But. Before I get into that, I do actually want to ask for a piece of feedback here from you guys. I haven't done a whole lot of theory crafting up until this point. I've usually kept it more or less to the lore and then just embellished on occasion when there seem to be logical leaps to be made. And I usually make it quite clear that well, that is what I'm doing as well. Whereas this, this is clearly a theory crafting episode. So I'm wondering how you guys feel about it, if you don't mind, or if you want to just perhaps be a bit more of a um, side thing. I don't know. Certainly not going to be replacing the regular content at any time soon, but I do enjoy coming up with a little bit of this occasionally. Anywho, until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching. Please do leave the feedback in the comment section down below, and as usual, if you enjoyed the video, please do consider sharing it around, because it really does help the channel, and uh, with the situation being what it is, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who could use a little bit of extra entertainment. Have a good day.